Welcome, this is Anna Galletli, and we're going to continue working on part four of our muscle physiology. In this section, we will look at the motor unit, talk a little bit more about the neuromuscular junction, and then go over the whole thing all over again from beginning to end on how you transmit a signal from the neuron to the muscle cell. All right, so before we can really talk about the muscles anymore, we really need to talk about the motor neurons. And so this is a preview of what we're gonna talk about more with the uh, nervous system physiology when we get to that in a few weeks. So motor neuron. So the neuron is going to be the cell that transmits signals and it's doing it typically over and at least in this case over long distances and there are other situations where the distance isn't all that long but this is a major communication cell okay motor whenever you see that we're talking about movement of some kind you're probably going to think about muscles most of the time but it can be motor innervation to other things as well like glands and so forth now the motor neuron, in this case, we are looking at a multipolar motor neuron, okay? And all of these things live within the central nervous system. So the cell body, which is basically kind of the head, that is in either your brain or spinal cord. Now, this part down here, the tail, will come out of the spinal cord and go to the muscles of the body. So this is going to go to all of your skeletal muscles, but also cardiac muscles, smooth muscle, and other things that we will get on into eventually. Now, if you want to divide it between skeletal muscle and um, involuntary muscles, then we can add another word to the name. We can call them somatic motor neurons or autonomic ne motor neurons. And ANS is short for the autonomic nervous system. Okay? Now we're looking at a picture of one motor neuron and you need to remember that this single motor neuron is going to be going to a couple of different cells maybe you know a few maybe a few hundred but it's not going to be the only thing in play there's going to be a lot of motor neurons in play but each single muscle fiber is going to be controlled by one motor neuron okay it's not a one-to-one -one situation but Basically, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that you're not going to have five neurons going to a muscle cell, despite the fact that this muscle cell might go all the way from your spinal cord down to your toes, okay? It'll be one neuron that is in charge, okay? All right, let's summarize some more information, and then we'll start going over some pictures again. All right, motor unit. What is a motor unit? The motor unit is going to consist of a single motor neuron, okay, but then it's going to have all the muscle cells or fibers that that particular motor neuron stimulates. So it's basically one, two, many, all right? It's not one neuron controls one cell, one neuron controls many cells, okay? But each muscle cell doesn't have many neurons going to it, okay? We call this relationship a unit or a motor unit, okay? So this single motor neuron, it might be going to 10 muscle cells or it might be going to hundreds of muscle cells, okay? So when you are looking at this, you will have your motor neuron, okay? And, all right, so there I'm drawing your little motor neuron. And this is gonna have little branches that are gonna kind of extend down and have little things that are gonna go and innervate that entire muscle cell. Um, when you do this, the idea is that you, you don't want it to be like a mega impact you want it to be kind of a gentle, spread out innervation over a large area, but you want this to contract as a unit. So basically, the beginning here is gonna contract at the same time as there, so it's gonna contract all together. This also helps 
when you're doing this to create sustained long acting contractions because you will have a single muscle belly with lots and lots of muscle cells in it and then you're going to have a neuron over here and a neuron over here and this neuron is going to control those and this neuron is going to control those and then you're going to have another neuron that comes over and it controls those so they can contract at different times so that some part of the muscle belly is contracting at all times but not all of it together so you get a long sustained contraction without fatigue okay which means and this is a key idea is that typically several motor units are both controlling and working together to do the muscle contractions um, for a muscle belly okay let's um let's do some more vocabulary and let's um kind of think about what we're doing here all right so please ignore this arrow over here i don't know why it copied over again this is a pdf conversion issue so as we go on to talk about the motor neuro, neuro, motor unit we need some basic vocabulary so the word load all right, when we use the word load, you're talking about the weight of the object that you're trying to move. Then you have the concept of isometric and isotonic, okay? If something is isometric, you cannot move it. If it's isotonic, you can move it. So I want you to visualize um, doing a plank versus doing a push-up, all right? You're using similar muscles. The push-up, is going to move the body so that is an isotonic movement the isometric is going to be a plank where you're not actually moving your body up and down you're holding it in one position or you could think of it as the difference between picking up an ice box or I'm sorry you might not know what an ice box is a refrigerator all right I can't pick up my refrigerator but I can pick up a chair okay so picking up the refrigerator would be isometric, picking up the chair would be isotonic, okay? But then we've also got the idea of concentric versus eccentric, and I need you to memorize these, okay? Concentric is when you shorten the muscle. So when you think of a bicep curl, all right? So this is when you're gonna bend your elbow so that your arm is like this, but then you make it like that, all right? So this movement, you are shortening the muscle as you pull the elbow or you pull the antibrachium up towards the brachium but as you go from here back to this position straightened out you are going to lengthen the muscle you are still having to control that movement but as you are contracting that biceps brachii and brachialis muscle they are actually getting longer as you increase the angle that is called an eccentric contraction. And these become really important because we're gonna be talking about antagonist contractions. And the antagonist contractions are often eccentric contractions, okay? All right, um, this particular picture, we're gonna be talking more about this as we go along, but what we're showing you here is the spinal cord. And we have our anterior horn right here, and you've got the cell body or the brain of your motor neuron. And you can see that there are two neurons coming out and they are going to this muscle belly. So these are the motor units. I've got two motor units, the purple motor unit and the green motor unit. And you can see here in the fascicles, they've got some colored purple and some colored green. And then there's another grouping of red fibers. So what they're showing you is how the different neurons are going to different muscle cells in this particular fascicle. And let's do that some more with a different picture. Let's talk about that some more. All right, again, ignore that arrow. That's a copy thing with the PDF. So again, we've got up here our spinal cord. This is our anterior horn where you find all of these cell bodies of your motor neurons. So I've got a purple one here and I've got a red one here. And you can see that the purple fiber comes out, the red fiber comes out. 
each one is its own motor neuron. So I've got my purple motor neuron and I've got my red motor neuron. Now, if we follow these, you will see that they come out so that, let me label these. I've got one, two, three, four, and five. So the purple neuron is gonna go to cell one, cell three, and cell four. The red is gonna go to cell two and cell five. And this is valuable because when you're doing a contraction, everybody needs to rest. So I can be picking up um, a box and I'm using cells one, three, and four, and then they start to get tired so they will relax and then I will use motor unit to contract two and five so that I don't drop the box. That brings up this idea of control, okay? We can have very precise control, average control, or gross control. So basically a motor unit can go to 10 cells, it can go to 100 cells, it can go to way more than 100 cells. If the motor neuron is controlling just a few cells, then it has very fine-tuned, precise control of those particular muscles because it doesn't have a lot to do. It's got to just control a few things. We're going to do this in places like the eyeball. So for the muscles that move your eye, um, places like for fine motor control with your hands and your fingers. Now for average control, that's going to be the, the bigger cells or the bigger muscle bellies, but, but not the postural ones. So like moving your elbow, moving your wrist. So, and it's going to go, that motor unit is going to control 10 to 100 cells. Okay. Gross you do not need to have fine control. You just need major movements. So this would be like the postural muscles of your back and abs, okay? All right, um, let's, let's look at another picture. All right, if we look at the top picture right here, we're basically kind of showing the same idea where you've got the spinal cord and I've got two motor neurons, the gray motor neuron and the red motor neuron. And you can see they're coming up to this muscle belly, and then the gray goes to these two, and the red goes to these muscle cells, okay? Now these are all within a fascicle. So I've got two different motor units controlling these, um, these cells within the fascicle, okay? Now down here I've thrown in this photomicrograph because it's cool, because I've got a cell here cell here, cell here, cell here, cell here. Here is the motor neuron coming out, having its um, terminal axons branch to different cells, and then you can see where their neuromuscular junctions are. And that's just kind of neat and pretty. And that's the only reason I'm putting in there is because it's neat and pretty, okay? So now that we've got this basic idea of what the neuromuscular junction, excuse me, what the motor unit is, let's focus in on the neuromuscular junction and what that is. All right, the neuromuscular junction. So first of all, you have a motor neuron and this cell body is gonna be within the spinal cord. And its axon or tail is going to come out of the spinal cord and it's going to go all the way down to a muscle cell, okay, or muscle belly with a lot of muscle cells in it. Now I'm going to have at the ends these branching little toes and that'll be the axon terminal. There's a gap called a synaptic cleft and then Let's focus in on our muscle cell right here. And here is one side of the sarcolemma. Here is the other side of the sarcolemma, which you'll, you'll remember is the plasma membrane. Then I've got this little wrinkly stuff right here. So I've got this wrinkled edge to the sarcolemma. This wrinkled edge is called the motor end plate. And this is where the neuron's axonal terminal comes up to the sarcolemma. Now there's a gap, as I've said, that's the synaptic cleft. They technically do not touch. There's a gap, okay? Now, in this area, right here, I'm gonna have little gates. And these gates are gonna respond to a chemical called acetylcholine, okay? 
Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's going to be secreted by the axonal terminal. And that is going to diffuse from here. Whoops. Let's blow this up. That's going to diffuse from, he from here over to the gates. It's going to open them. And then that is going to allow sodium to come in. So we're going to have little sodium molecules. And those sodium molecules are going to come in right there. Okay. It's also where potassium can come out. We've got calcium involved as well. Okay. The calcium is going to be responding to a gate over here. So calcium is going to come in here. We'll get to that in a minute because I've still got to uh, explain the difference between chemical gates and, um, oh God, I'm blanking on the word, voltage gates. Okay. But basically, this is where you're going to transmit the signal. And remember, the, the signal is transmitted with charged ions. So you're not dealing with free electrons. You're not dealing with electricity, like what you think of over power lines. You're dealing with charged ions that move from one side to the next, okay? Now, we tend to focus in a lot on the sodium and the potassium, but I want everybody to really pay attention to any place where I write down calcium or where I talk about calcium. There is this huge misconception that the most important place to have calcium, so where should calcium be? Everybody thinks that calcium goes to the bones. That that's the most important place. But it's not bones where calcium is the most important place to go to. It is muscle cells and neurons. If your blood is ever deficient in calcium, you are going to die horribly in a lot of pain if your blood becomes too deficient. Luckily, you got a lot of extra calcium stored in bones, but without the calcium, your neurons and your muscle cells will not function. So you really need to pay attention to the calcium as we discuss it in the muscle physiology chapter and in the neurophysiology chapter. All right, let's look at a nicer drawing of the neuromuscular junction. All right, so right here, this is one of my favorite models from the anatomy lab. This right here is a single muscle cell. This is my sarcolemma. This is my axon, which is myelinated. Here are the axonal terminals. This is where the motor end plate is. Okay. Each of these are myofibrils. And right here, that thing that looks like a band-aid is endomecium. All right. And this shows you really nicely how the axonal terminal comes up and it embeds in the sarcolemma. Now remember, it doesn't technically touch. There's a gap. Now if we look right here, we're also seeing a drawing where you see the axon in the axonal terminals. To me, they look like little tree frog toes, and they're going to come up, and they're going to create this indentation in the sarcolemma. And you can see one there, one there, and one there, and you can get a nice idea how you've got a single neuron, and it's going to connect at multiple places on the sarcolemma. All right. Now let's look at this um, from a different angle. All right, now again we are looking at the axon of a motor neuron. This end right here is the axonal terminal. The synaptic cleft is the gap. Is this gap right here. Okay. And then <clears throat> this is the motor end plate of your sarcolemma, okay? So what's gonna happen is you're gonna have what is called an action potential. We haven't really talked about that yet, but we will. But basically, this is your electrical signal. 
And again, remember that it is basically charged ions that are moving, not free electrons, okay? So they're gonna come down here, and they're gonna come here and here, and they're not really showing it, so I'm gonna draw it in. But I basically have what is called a voltage gate for calcium. So when I have a signal coming down here, it's changing the voltage along the membrane, and that is going to open this voltage gate right here. Now this red dots are representing the calcium. The calcium comes into the axonal terminal. The calcium triggers these vesicles to release their contents into the synaptic cleft. Those contents are acetylcholine, which you can write using ACH. So the acetylcholine comes into here. Now along the sarcolemma of the end plate, I have gates, which are called um, chemical gates for acetylcholine. They will open and then that will allow sodium to diffuse into the cell where it'll then go to the troponin complex and trigger the sliding filament mechanism. All right, let's look at that a little bit closer. All right, now we're looking at yellow at the axon. So we're in the axon. Down here is the inside of our muscle cell. So we can see, and we're skipping some steps, but here's the vesicle that had the acetylcholine in it. And now the vesicle is emptying the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, which is right there. Now here in purple are my chemical gates. And they only open for acetylcholine. And when they open, they allow sodium, actually, let me change the color of that. They allow sodium to go in through the gates. Now the sodium, look, it's got a charge on it. See that plus sign? So it is a charged ion. So that charged ion is going to start changing the voltage. So it'll change the voltage within the cell which is an important point to remember. Now I wanna just draw your attention to the little green bobbles and you can see how they're hooking onto the gate and they've opened the gate so that the sodium can go into it. Okay, all right, let's look at another picture of this. All right, so you're seeing that I'm going over multiple pictures trying to show different views and different details in them. What you want to do is start picking out the pictures you like the best and draw it out. Draw it out with labels five times. Explain it to someone else as you're drawing it. This is really, really important because you're not going to get it if you don't do that. So we've got up here our axon and I've got an action potential or electrical signal coming down. All right, that's going to come down here and then not drawn in. So you gotta use your imagination, is a chemical gate, excuse me, not a chemical gate, a voltage gate for calcium. That voltage gate opens, and now you can see these thingies right here diffuse into the cell. That is going to trigger down here the green acetylcholine to come out. So let's go over to this picture and what you see now are these merging into the walls and now the acetylcholine has drifted over. Now here are the acetylcholine gates. So this is right here the receptors for acetylcholine. These are chemical gates that open only for acetylcholine. So when the acetylcholine hooks into this, 
it opens them up and that is going to allow sodium to then go into the muscle cell and you can see how the motor end plate is stacked with lots and lots of these acetylcholine receptors which are going to be opening in response so let's look at these a little bit bigger so in this picture right here we've got the acetylcholine receptor this chemical gate and it's closed so we have just brought over acetylcholine and we put them in so these are like keys going into a lock on a door that triggers this thing to change its shape when it does that it basically opens this and now sodium can flow in and potassium can flow out all right and you will see that these are also called ligand regulated ligand is referring to a protein in this case, this protein is also a chemical, so you can call these ligand gates or chemical gates. Either one is correct. All right, let's look at these in action. All right, so now right here, let's get oriented. This is the axon, okay? And here's the acetylcholine. It's released into the synaptic cleft, all right? This is all synaptic cleft. This is my sarcolemma right here, and this is my chemical gate. So this is my chemical gate or my ligand gate for acetylcholine. All right. And what it allows in is sodium. It allows sodium to go in and potassium to go out. Again, chemical, chemical. It only opens in response to acetylcholine. Now we're going to follow this over. And once we get out of the motor end plate, we come across what are called voltage gates and they've got them colored for two different things because only they're allowing different um, charged ions to go through them. So this gate opens in response to a chemical. These gates open in response to a change in the voltage. The voltage is going to change because of the sodium that came in here. So this sodium makes it more positive on the inside, which changes the voltage, which then allows these two gates to open. Now what I want you to pick up on is that this boundary line, okay? So on this side, it's the motor end plate, and you've got the chemical gates. And on this side, it's outside the motor end plate, and you're gonna be looking at voltage gates. And this will become important as we start talking about generation of action potentials, which we're gonna start doing. It's gonna get increasingly complex as I go over it with different pictures. Um, the next, within the PowerPoint, I've got a note slide that says generation of action potential but boxes from the next slide. I'm not gonna read that f to you from here, but you basically, have what each one of the boxes say as I go over these pictures. All right, let's talk about the action potential. And remember, this action potential, what I want you to think of this is how you move an electrical signal a long distance. And this is gonna be the movement again of charged ions Right, and we want to get it from the spinal cord to a muscle cell. So we're basically going to bring this action potential down the axon over here, and it's moving along, and it's going to hit this gate right here. And this is, oops, and I wrote the wrong thing over here. This is a calcium voltage gate that in response to the change in voltage from the action potential opens and when it opens the red calcium comes inside and this calcium is going to trigger these vesicles to move over here and those vesicles are then going to open and I can't erase that let's see they're gonna open and then I'm gonna have blue acetylcholine so that is representing acetylcholine our neurotransmitter and the acetylcholine is going to come over here 
and it's going to hook onto my acetylcholine chemical gate, which you will see I labeled right over there, okay? When it does that, we're gonna erase these and show you what happens. It's going to do this, okay? And I'm gonna put the acetylcholine on there so that you can see it. Now, I can take, let's change the color again, sodium molecules, all right, which are gonna be represented as yellow, and those can begin diffusing into the cell. This is going to change the voltage inside the cell. We'll eventually get to where we talk about resting membrane potential, and this will make a little bit more sense. But basically, what I want you to start visualizing is a three to two ratio of sodium to potassium, okay? And what this means is that when I look at the charge on either side of my resting membrane potential, I've got, let me erase this so that we can see, um, how do I wanna do this? I'm gonna do three N's to two potassiums, all right? So a three to two ratio which means I have more positive on the outside, so more positive on outside and less positive on the inside. And I'm using that language on purpose because both sodium and potassium are positively charged ions. What that results in is that when you look at this ratio, I've got three positive ions on the outside and only two positive ions on the inside, which ultimately results in a resting membrane potential of positive on the outside and negative on the inside. Okay? And this is important because what I wanna do is change that charge in order to get that to open, okay? And so it's responding to, to those to do that. Now, when, when I do this, it is called depolarization, okay? So when it's at rest, I have a polarized membrane at rest. If I change the polarity, if I change the voltage, I'm going to depolarize that membrane and I depolarize that membrane by letting more positive ions inside. Now I could say I do it by letting more positive sodium ions on the inside, but I don't want you to get hung up on the sodium because there are cases where it's not the sodium that's most critical. It's really the fact that you're changing the ratio of positively charged ions and bringing them in. Okay, now as I am doing this, all right, I'm also going to have another chemical in here. Let's find another color to use. Do I have another color? Oh, I guess we'll just use, that doesn't work. I need another color. Hmm, I guess we'll have to use purple. Um, we're gonna have what is called, and I'm just gonna write it in here, acetyl, acetyl, Acetylcholinesterase, or ACHAs. So this is an enzyme, and because you've got the A's on the end, the A's on the end, this acetylcholinesterase is in here, and it's going through and it's attacking all of the acetylcholine, and it's basically cleaving it. And when it cleaves it, it closes these gates. As you close the gates, there are various mechanisms, but basically it's gonna restore this three to two ratio of sodium and potassium ions. And as it does that, it's called repolarization. All right, so repolarization returns the membrane back to its resting state. 
okay? So I want you to remember this uh, um, acetylcholinesterase as well, okay? So this is one of those things where I would like you to draw it out five times and get all of these steps in the best you can. Maybe you number them, maybe you do different drawings to show different states of development. And be aware that we're actually gonna start adding more pieces as we start looking at the different videos. So the next video we're gonna look at is gonna focus in on that resting membrane potential a little bit more. So you've got a little bit of an intro to it, and now we're gonna have you take a break and then come back and watch the next part and we'll talk more about that resting membrane potential.